So, so the last um, two hours will be on the blackboard. Let me, as I had a question, um, make clear in what sense the, the post Minkowskian approach has allowed to know something uh, to all orders in 1 over C, which was known only to limited order, what it meant. Okay, what it meant was that initially when you have um, the binary system with uh, a real uh, energy, E real, and when you do a post-Newtonian uh, uh, discussion of the binding energy, you naturally introduce what the binding energy, which is the real energy, minus the rest mass energy of the full system, which is the sum of the two masses multiplied by C squared. If you divide by the mu C squared, it's just a dimensionless measure of the binding energy. And when you are in a PN context, uh, you don't know the relation between the effective energy and this binding energy. What you know uh, is that uh, this contains also uh, a mu c square contribution. So this thing starts by, by one. And then you write the most general uh, thing you can uh, write, except that from the Newtonian uh, physics, you know the first that the, the binding energy should be equal to the real binding energy. But after that, there could be arbitrary coefficients. Uh, because there is a 1 over c square here, you see this term is 1 over c square, this term is 1 over c4, this, uh, this term is 1 over c6. So at each order in PN calculation where you have a limited order in 1 over c, you can determine some of these coefficients but not beyond this. And what was done in the calculation was it was found at 2 PN that this coefficient is equal to mu over 2. Uh, then this one was found to be equal to zero. The next was found to be equal to zero, but you never knew for sure that they were all equal to zero. And the post minkowskian calculation, because it does not expand in 1 over C, but only in G, and uh, this is not an expansion in powers of G. It has nothing to do with the coupling of gravity. It is uh, expansion in 1 over C. Uh, in one go, the uh, post minkowskian scattering theory tells you that these numbers are, are zero to infinity so that the relation between the effective energy and the real energy is given by this formula, which says that the effective energy is essentially the square of the real energy. And that will play an important role in the following. So this morning, I did all the calculation in front of you to compute the scattering, the classical scattering of uh, two uh, massive point mass, massive particles, point masses interacting via gravity, point masses of things. We computed what was the scattering angle at first order in the Newton interaction constant. So in general, the scattering theory, uh, the classical scattering angle in the center of mass is a function of the real energy and it's a, it's a gauge invariant quantity. Yeah, we are in general relativity, so we have to be careful to discuss only quantities that are independent of the coordinate system. But uh, uh, in the same way that the quantum scattering amplitude is only from uh, s matrix type from minus infinity to plus infinity, here also we have something which is from the Minkowski at minus infinity to Minkowski at plus infinity, so it does not depend on the choice of coordinates in the middle of space time. So the, the scattering angle in the center of mass of each particle, uh, which means if I am in the center of mass, I have two particles, you know, that go with opposite momenta, and they come in from infinity, and then they go out uh, with an angle which differs from the incoming angle by this chi. Okay, so this is a gauge invariant quantity. If I express it as a function of the real energy of the system, measured also incoming energy at minus infinity and the angular momentum, uh, I can, uh, uh, this function is a gauge variant function. Now, let me, uh, when, when we did the calculation this morning at first order, actually, uh, we found that it had, um, it was inversely proportional to the <laughs> angular momentum J. The reason is simply that the angular momentum J is the impact parameter times 
the center of mass momentum of each particle in the center of mass. And this expansion for scattering theory is a, a large impact parameter expansion. You, you say, uh, if I start with a large enough impact parameter, uh, there will be, if, if the impact parameter is infinite, the angle is zero, okay, of scattering. If the uh, impact parameter is finite, I will have a term of order one over b, and then one over b squared, and things like that. So I will have an expansion <laughs> in inverse powers of j. Now, it is convenient to introduce a dimensionless measure of the orbital angular momentum, which is the real orbital angular momentum divided by g m1, m2. Because when c equal 1, this is a dimensionless uh, quantity. Uh, so anyway, we can always introduce it. Let's also introduce small h, which is the real energy in the center of mass divided by the m, where m is the, the sum of the two masses. Uh, by the way, henceforth, I set c equal 1, OK? Uh, as I'm now uh, here, I, I put the c's. OK, now I put c equal 1. Uh, otherwise, I have powers of c's here and here. <coughs> and uh, OK, uh, what we found uh, was that the first term, uh, yes, let me write the thing, then I will explain uh, why. OK, uh, this morning, uh, we computed this term. Uh, this term corresponded to this classical diagram. And at the end of the lecture, I will discuss how it also corresponds to the Feynman diagram computing this amplitude. OK, now I want to discuss the next term. Uh, this term, because it is 1 over j, and as you see, 1 over j, just formally, is g m1, m2 over the real j. Uh, therefore, 1 over j is actually first order in Newton's constant g. So, so this term uh, is of order g to the power 1. This term is of power g to the 2. So it is called 1 pm. This is called 2 pm. Okay. And now I'm going to discuss that 2 pm means one loop. And uh, 3 p.m. means two loops. And it would be, it is, I will show how to use two loop results to compute things. Quant uh, the only calculations that exist of the gravitational scattering at two loops was done many years ago by ACV, Amati Ciafaloni Veneziano. And I, I will show how to transcribe it in something new that was not known from the classical point of view. I've been pushing people. Uh, uh, like Pierre Vanov and John Joseph Carrasco to do a two-loop calculation of the uh, qu uh, quantum scattering because I will give a dictionary how to transcribe uh, a two-loop uh, in, in a term here. And I will show, yes, now what I want to show is that uh, these are functions of the energy, okay? And each, each one, so there is a, a function of energy uh, the, the classical scattering gives at its order g, finally, only one function of the total energy. Okay? And we have shown at first order what was this function chi1. I will show what is the uh, chi2. Each one of these functions can be transcribed in an EOB Hamiltonian, uh, which has the advantage of being valid also for binary systems in elliptic motions. Okay? So bound states. You can discuss. So uh, classically, uh, you have something which is purely a scattering angle, nothing to do with bound states. But this goes to an Hamiltonian, which then computes bound states. This goes to an Hamiltonian, which comes bound states. And the idea is that the quantum version of this also give the same, I mean, can give this information, but one needs to compute them. So this morning, I describe in detail uh, what means classically this diagram, and I computed it for you. It's uh, how to compute the scattering angle uh, from this. But I said this morning also that when you compute this, for instance, you have to integrate this system. For, so A is a label which goes from 1 to 2, which is either the first world line, A equal 1, or the second world line. Okay? 
each word line has equations of motion, which are geodesic equations of motion, which means that the derivative of the word line uh, is equal to uh, the, the four momentum in curved space time. I write the four momentum here in covariant way. This is why uh, I need the metric to raise this index up. But with this notation, I am using it because the covariant momentum, this in my A, satisfy minus one half, if I write it this way, is the same expression that I wrote before, except that I use the inverse metric. Okay, I use the inverse metric because here, this way, I have P A alpha, P A beta. So you see, this is a, this is a system of differential equation, which if I know along the world line of a particle, the metric G, uh, I can integrate this, and in particular, I can get the change between the incoming momentum, P, P mu in space time, and the outgoing momentum. And this information about the change of momentum gives me the scattering angle, which gives me this expansion. Okay. This morning, we, we, we showed directly how to compute this to first order. To first order, it's very easy. You, you, you solve the, the metric is given by a linearized expression. Uh, so, given two word line, uh, you can write the metric as at linearized approximation, it is the sum of the metric created by the first word line plus the metric created by the second word line. But uh, when you go beyond that, you have to take into account that the first word line creates a gravitational field, the second word lines create a gravitational field. They interact nonlinearly because I solve Einstein equations which are nonlinear, so I solve the Lambert of H equal terms nonlinear in H. And then this creates a gravitational field, okay, at point X. And then once so I know G mu nu uh, as a set of diagram of this type, then I compute the derivative of G mu nu on this thing, I integrate. So finally, it gives me a diagrammatic representation, classical, of the scattering angle. By, uh, and the, the first order uh, diagram would be this. And then you have uh, diagrams uh, like that. But you need to take into account something else, as Ricardo noticed. Uh, in general, the world lines are curved. Why are they curved? Because they follow this equation, which means all the time P mu changes. So when I do perturbation theory starting with straight world lines, I need to take into account that the world lines do not stay straight during the calculation, that they uh, evolve. And when you do that, you find that you, you get ladder diagrams. Ladder meaning also cross ladder diagrams. Cross ladder diagrams classically just means that I compute this, but in the calculation, I have to take into account that the world line has shifted a little bit. And then when you look at it, you find the famous uh, econal type uh, 1 over kp uh, uh, denominator in doing that. OK. I also, uh, yes, yeah, so you have more, uh, uh, classically, you have more of these uh, diagrams. Like, for instance, you have also, sorry, the, the, yeah, the, the weird lines are more attracted than uh, repel, but anyway, it's just a convention. You have uh, a diagram like that means what? It means that uh, when I solve Einstein equations, I solve this equal uh, the source, linearized source, plus uh, two derivatives acting on H. But I have also that the source is modified by H, because the, the T mu nu of the source contains square root of minus G mu nu. When I expand it in the source, I have H also. So this means that the graviton H uh, uh, because I'm solving this as coupled to the source, etc. So you have a classically, you just uh, it's it's Picard integration, okay? Nothing but Feynman is also uh, it's a Picard Dyson uh, iteration anyway. Uh, you have a set uh, of uh, uh, you c you compute something uh, which uh, is technically uh, given by uh, can be represented classically this way. But, uh, but each one of these diagrams has a, a correspondent in, uh, in a Feynman diagram. The only diagrams that uh, would not be present classically are diagrams like that, okay, which would be graviton loops, really, which do not enter the classical calculation. So 
There are more uh, quantum diagrams than classical diagrams. Now, this morning, I could give you the, the explicit computation of this thing. Uh, it's still to guess. <laughs> I mean, in principle, if you think about it, it takes five minutes. It took me 30 minutes to explain it, but uh, uh, it can be much faster than that. So, uh, the vertices are not always trivalent. Uh, but at this order, yeah, in Einstein, they are vertices to all orders, yes. Because in Einstein equations, when you expand them, because there is the inverse metric G uh, in the metric, so the inverse of uh, as an infinite number of powers, so they are, they are quartic, and et cetera, things, to any order. But at, at, a, at a finite order in G, you have only uh, what I wrote there. So this morning, I computed for you what was the first order uh, chi, chi 1, and if I um, now, um, yes, now as I have proven uh, this formula, uh, instead of expressing uh, chi 1 in terms of the total energy uh, H, I can use uh, the relation between the real energy and the effective energy, uh, which is quadratic there, to express it in terms of the uh, effective energy, that is to say, uh, divided by mu. So uh, E at effective is the effective energy defined by this formula. So it is the left-hand side uh, of this equation. So it is uh, S minus M1 square S2 square, etc. Actually, in terms of kinematic invariant, this thing is minus P1 dot P2 over M1, M2. You, know, you have two incident momenta at minus infinity. You do the dot product, minus sign, because I use the mostly positive signature. And uh, this is a dimensionless measure uh, of the relative uh, uh, velocity between the two particles that I use as uh, independent variables. OK. Chi 1 as a function of uh, E real and, uh, and j, uh, or if, uh, equivalently E hat effective and small j. Uh, Sorry, chi 1 is just a function of the energy. So. Ah, I, 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 uh, the other variable that I wrote here was nu. I remind you, for people who missed the thing, that nu is the symmetric mass ratio. It is the product of the two masses divided by the square of the sum of the two masses. Okay. It's a dimensionless number which is positive and goes between 0 and 1 fourth. Okay. Now, at first order, this thing is equal to 2 square minus 1 over uh, square root of the uh, effective square minus 1, OK? Where I remind you this 2 and minus 1, or if I divide by 2, 1 uh, e square minus 1 half is the famous t mu nu minus 1 half of t eta mu nu in Einstein equation. It's just the propagator uh, uh, of Einstein's uh, graviton, OK? It's the spin 2 propagator you see here. Now, the calculation of the chi 2 is, the classical calculation is actually complicated, OK? Because you need explicitly, you have one loop diagrams now, OK? These, these things means you integrate over the intermediate point, and you also, after that, integrate over the world line. So it is a non-trivial calculation. And in the 1980s, a younger version than myself and collaborators, and independently uh, Konradin Westphal in Germany, computed uh, the, the metric generated by two point particles to the second post Minkowskian approximation. And in it, we needed a few special integrals, uh, OK? Uh, because there is this one loop. Uh, one loop integral is a one loop integral. Again, there is really an integral to do somewhere. And the, the corresponding calculation of the scattering angle has been done by uh, Westphal. And the result is quite, uh, is quite simple, but uh, it's normal because uh, it's just a function of one variable. So it cannot be hyper complicated. But still, it is, uh, is simpler than what you might think in view of what you need to do to compute it. because. The, the second order term, so order g square, is 3 pi over 8. So there is pi now coming in. Why there it was rational here. Times not 2 e square minus 1, but 5 e effective square minus 1. 
divided by square root of 1 plus 2 mu e hat effective minus 1. OK, so anyway, it is the result uh, of a calculation. And now, what I want to uh, describe explicitly is how do you transcribe this information, which is the second order scattering, uh, the uh, scattering angle classical at second order in, in G, in terms of a knowledge of the interacting Hamiltonian described in the effective one body uh, approach of a two body system. Uh, how do you do that? To do that, as I said this morning, you, the idea of the effective one body is to say the same scattering angle, so finally, this expression to this order of approximation with this expression and this expression should be the scattering angle of a particle moving in a certain effective metric or given by a certain uh, mass shell condition that I will uh, write, uh, which fully uh, encapsulates uh, this information, OK? So let's do it, OK? To do that, um, so as we, as we have discussed, when doing this effective one body transcription of the Hamiltonian dynamics in the post-Newtonian sense, uh, we found that the motion could not be just a geodesic in an external space-time. It had to include uh, terms uh, of higher powers of p in uh, like a Finsler geometry, that is to say a mass shell condition, which is not mu square plus p square, but mu square plus p square plus terms p4, higher powers of p. So a more general function of p. Let me write, as we have shown this morning, that this, this result is fully equivalent to saying that uh, I have a particle moving in a Schwarzschild, uh, linearized Schwarzschild uh, space-time. So this is equivalent to this. Uh, now I looked for something beyond Schwarzschild. So I will parameterize the mass shell condition by saying the mass shell condition is, uh, is G mu nu is something quadratic in P, okay, plus mu square. So Let's indeed not be confused. This mu means the reduced mass to be distinguished from this index mu. OK, I could use alpha, beta, but. Uh. <laughs> and then I just write uh, a certain function q of uh, position and, uh, and momenta. Here we will see uh, three dimensionally projected uh, position and momenta. It's just a way of writing a very general mass shell condition. Okay. Uh, as a function of momenta, this I could say, maybe I could expand it in powers of momenta. There will be terms quadratic in momenta, quartic in momenta. The terms quadratic in momenta, I could say, ah, they modify this thing, which is quadratic in momenta. But I don't even do that here. I just say, okay, let's forget about that for the moment. Let's just put a Q. And because we will see that it is a much more complicated, it should not be expanded in powers of p. The new information is that you don't want to expand q in powers of p, which is the usual post-Newtonian. You want to keep it as an exact function of p. And because now, uh, I, and now I can consider just as a convention that this metric is the Schwarzschild metric, which means what? Which means that, remember, the Schwarzschild metric is d squared is minus a dt square plus b d r square plus r square d theta square plus sine square theta d phi square, where a uh, is the inverse of the b function, and this is 1 minus 2 g m over r. So now I am assuming that this object is given by the Schwarzschild answer. Because the Schwarzschild answer uh, explains completely this thing. Therefore, this object here will be of order g squared. So I'm now looking for something, perturbation theory in powers of g. I look for a modification of what was true to first order, except I write it exactly Schwarzschild because it incorporates terms this way. OK, now I want to compute the scattering angle in this setting. 
How do I do that? As I explained this morning, I open again Landau Lifshitz, and Landau Lifshitz tell me Hamilton Jacobi. Okay? So uh, this is a mass shell condition. So I, I write uh, I write this equation when I write it explicitly means uh, minus the effective energy square divided by A because it's the inverse of G P zero is the cons yes I should say the effective energy is minus P zero down okay it's the conserve uh, momentum linked to time translations. Okay, there is a time translation invariance. P0 down is the Noether quantity. Is that? You put a minus sign because you know uh, you want energy positive. And uh, Nj is P5. Okay, so uh, among the uh, in, in radial coordinates, R theta phi, if I'm in the equatorial plane, I can do that classically. Uh, I already know that the two components of uh, the momentum are uh, this constants of motion. The only uh, uh, part of P which, uh, which will vary is, so let me write this, is plus uh, P phi square uh, over, uh, over R square, okay, uh, plus uh, P R square uh, over B, plus mu square, plus Q. Okay. From this equation, I can compute uh, PR. Uh, let me remind you that if you open Landau Lifshitz, you find, or if you redo the calculation, this is one line, you find that the scattering angle as a function of energy and angular momentum, where uh, small p or capital P is the same. Okay. Uh, no, it's a small p here anyway. Sometimes I change the notation. So uh, this is fixed, this is fixed. I can compute, p so from this equation, I, I can compute PR. Uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a function of this and this. Evidently, you tell me, no, I cannot compute PR because Q is also a function of PR. Yes, but we are doing perturbation theory. This is second order in G, so I will expand in this, and we will see later uh, what we do with this dependence, okay? Uh, what is important is to have a formula for the scattering angle, and this is minus D by D angular momentum. It's the universal formula of Hamilton-Jacobi dynamics which is the integral of PR uh, as a function of R, energy, and angular momentum, okay? Now, PR is obtained by this quadratic equation. So PR is the square root of something which contains Q. Q is uh, small, second order energy, so I can expand powers of G. As I explained this morning, I need to do contour integrals a la Sommerfeld because I have uh, di divergent integrals, but these are uh, Adama Partifini. So at the end, you at the end you get an explicit formula, which is which is the following. Uh, you use this formula. You expand. This is a one. Uh, no, uh, no, no, because uh, Adama Partifini are for integrals that contain square root half integer powers. So, uh, okay, this and, and what you do is uh, when you do an AT continuation, if you want, you have no poles and things like that. You do the, actually, it's evident that there is one finite value for uh, well defined. You do an AT continuation in the power, if you want, of the root. Uh, when you go to one half or three half, there are no poles, whatever. So you don't need, uh, there are no logs and there are no principal values. Okay, it's Adama Partifini. There is a long discussion in the book of Schwartz on distributions uh, because Adama was his uh, father-in-law, uh, whatever, great uncle, yes. Um, anyway, at the end, you get the following formula, explicit formula, one half, the one half is just conventional, of the uh, scattering angle, chi effective J, minus the answer, because if I don't put Q, the calculation here is what? It's the calculation of the scattering angle of a particle in a Schwarzschild spacetime. What I'm assuming here is that you open again uh, Landau Lifshitz, and for Schwarzschild, you have the answer. It is given by an elliptic integral that you can compute, you can write explicitly, or whatever. Anyway, Schwarzschild, everybody knows how to do. It's not trivial, but uh, uh, you compute it. And, uh, and it is computed in my paper explicitly to fifth order, if you want to see the thing. So the difference 
between the answer for the, the scattering angle of a particle around a Schwarzschild black hole. So this thing is the scattering angle of particle flying at some impact parameter around the Schwarzschild black hole. And we are interested in the corrections linked to Q, to compute Q. Uh, is second order in G. And what you find is that uh, this thing is equal to one fourth the partial derivative with respect to J of the integral uh, simply of Q uh, by, by D sigma, where D sigma zero uh, is dr divided by PR up. By the way, the, the index R here was down, which is important for this formula to be valid. PR up means you use GR up, so you use a factor B to modify it. So it's not the same thing. And this is the proper time uh, uh, divided by mu, which is the same notation I used there. So this proper time is along, uh, at this order, along the along the Schwarzschild, uh, this thing, because I computed already the, the correction of order G. So, so the answer is very simple. Uh, the difference uh, between uh, this thing and the computation in the Schwarzschild space-time uh, is proportional to the J derivative of the integral of this thing that I try to determine fully along the world line from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay? Uh, immediately, you see that the answer has a gauge invariance, because if I add to Q a proper time derivative, if I change Q by d by d sigma of any function, the answer will not depend on that. When you think about it, you realize that it's because if you look at the Stuckelberg Hamiltonian, you know, Stuckelberg was the first one to say before Fock, I think, maybe not, uh, that you can view relativistic mechanics as mechanics uh, in a super time uh, with a super Hamiltonian, which is uh, one half, let's say Minkowski space time, one half of eta mu nu uh, p mu p nu uh, plus mu square. Okay? If you use this as an Hamiltonian, uh, you get a dynamics. Uh, uh, not in time, but in proper time, okay? And Stuckelberg uh, introduced uh, years before Feynman uh, things that went up and back in time, particle creation this way. Anyway, uh, when you think about it at the super Hamiltonian level, you find that indeed I can do canonical transformation in X mu P mu. In it, six and Zuber, by the way, it's also discussed, this thing. Uh, no, I, I mean you add, uh, you have, you you view particles. Yes, yes, you view particles like moving in space-time like that. Okay, and then you need an extra parameter to see their motion. Thing. So it's this Hamiltonian dynamics. Just it's the Polyakov action at uh, for the particles. Okay, so it's the desert bring uh, whatever action. Uh, now, uh, I'm saying that because. There is a gauge invariance. The, uh, I cannot determine, the function Q is not uniquely determined. I have a choice. Uh, I can modify the, the way, uh, because it's going to be very important. <laughs> uh, I can uh, shuffle around the way Q is written as a function of momenta and position, because I can always add something which integrates to zero. And um, this morning, we have seen that when you fix the gauge in the EUB uh, Hamiltonian in a way which looked convenient for binary systems that were uh, uh, near circular motion, that generated uh, something infinite in the uh, self force expansion of uh, the function A. Now we are going to see that you avoid this and you understand what happens at uh, infinitely large energies, that it is not a problem, actually. Uh, but for this, you need to use another representation of the Hamiltonian. Uh, then we are going to um, uh, you show. Uh, okay, let me write the Q is a function which, at order uh, g square, uh, must be of the type 
u square, so let me define u. u is gm over r, like before, OK? It's a dimensionless uh, variable. Order. First, G. yeah. So this is second order in G. And as I am expanding in powers of G, I must be uh, modulo logs that do not uh, appear here, uh, gm over r square, and then a certain function of the uh, momenta. At third order in G, I will have e cube q3 of p. At fourth order in G, u fourth q4 of p. OK. Now, because of what I said, you can express q2 not in terms of all the components of p, but only of the conserved energy. OK? So what we are going to do, so this is called uh, now the uh, energy gauge. Let's assume that this is a function of the uh, effective Hamiltonian. OK? I want it a function of the momenta. So I use the Marshall condition to say the energy is the Hamiltonian as function of momenta. So it's still a function of momenta, but this is conserved. Now, uh, now the integral is easy to do because uh, this is a function of energy. It is constant under the integration. So the only integration is the integral of uh, 1 over r square over the proper time. Okay? And this is uh, easy to do. And when you, I don't show the explicit computation, but let me just give the, the answer. The answer is that starting from this thing, which should be uh, here on the left-hand side minus the Schwarzschild answer. By the way, what is the Schwarzschild answer? The Schwarzschild value of the scattering angle to second order is obtained from the two-body answer by taking the limit where one mass is much smaller than the other one. So the answer is just by uh, taking nu equals zero. So the answer is given by this thing up, OK? So I subtract from this this, and then I get q2. So now let me write the result. The result is, I will push it up then, is, let me take away this. The result is that Q2, as a function of the uh, energy, let me write here. then I will comment on the result H effective nu, E is equal to 3 half times you, you have actually, you find the same factor, which was here, 5, five effective energy squared minus 1. But then this is multiplied by, do you remember what is u? I hope. 1 minus 1 over square root of 1 plus 2 nu h effective minus 1. So summarizing, from the second order uh, in G calculation of the scattering angle, I compute this function Q, which gives me, uh, which gives me the effective one-body description of the Marshall condition, which is given by uh, this plus this plus this, where Q is given by this first term, U squared times this function. So now I have an explicit uh, representation uh, of the uh, Hamiltonian of the, the Marshall condition at uh, second order in G, which is new, okay? That uh, was not known uh, before. And now I'm going to discuss uh, this thing as, as, uh, as special properties which are linked to uh, various physics, including the one of Amati Ciafaloni. Veneziano. That I want to describe now. Aha, it's nearly one hour. Okay. Let's take the uh, high energy. Let's consider the high energy limit now. Um, okay, the advantage of doing a post-Minkowskian calculation is that I'm not limited to small velocities. So 
let's go to the ultra uh, high velocities where the velocities are near the velocity of light just to see what we get and if we can make connections, uh, interesting connections. If I look at my, uh, yes, maybe I should write the Hamiltonian. So at the end, the effective Hamiltonian, so we are talking about an effective, so what would you give? This thing finally tells me that the square of the effective Hamiltonian is equal, let me write it correctly, yes, is given by the Schwarzschild Hamiltonian square, I will write down what it means, plus 1 minus 2u, u square q2 of h at this order Schwarzschild and u, this I know, and the next term okay, same thing, plus etc. Okay, so each Schwarzschild square is the square of the Hamiltonian of a particle uh, in a Schwarzschild space-time. This is 1 minus 2u times 1 plus 1 minus 2u pr square plus p phi square u square. So I remind you that u is gm over r, okay? 1 minus 2u is Schwarzschild 1 minus 2m over r, okay, in the Marshall condition. This is pr square divided by the coefficient of dr square, which is the inverse of 1 minus 2u, that's why it is up. This term is the centrifugal energy p phi square divided by r square, but r is 1 over u, and the p, small p now is scaled by uh, g mu, okay, so there have been some scaling going around, okay? And so it gives me, so at the end, one is saying that the real Hamiltonian of a two-body system as a function of position and momentum, okay, is equal to the total mass square root of 1 plus 2 nu h effective at minus 1, not f h effective square, h effective, where h effective is the square root of this thing. So you see, we have a nested square root, uh, the real Hamiltonian of a two-body system for scattering but also binding state in the second post corner is the square root of the square root of this thing. But everything is fully explicit, okay? Now, <coughs> let's consider the ultra-high energy limit where E hat goes to infinity. When E hat goes to infinity, this goes to zero, and this term goes to something quadratic in E square. The important uh, aspect is that uh, the mass shell condition, I said, the mass shell condition was P square plus mu square plus Q. And I said Q, when you expand it in post-Newtonian, is not quadratic in P. It contains quadratic, quartic, and things like that. But when you go to the ultra-high energy limit, it becomes again quadratic because you see Q is proportional to this function Q2, which is this. So when I go to ultra-high energy, I get, I am again, I have this nonlinear structure, one over square root of thing, which if I expand it, generates cubic, quartic, things like that. But uh, when I go to ultra high energy, things simplify again. And then I find that at ultra high energy, the mass shell condition, uh, so at ultra high energy, the scattering of two particles is equivalent to the scattering of a particle, again in a geodesic now. But this geodesic is the ultra high energy limit of uh, what I got by this calculation. And now we are going to show how to use the result of uh, ACV, uh, Amati Chafolini uh, Veneziano, to get uh, new information. Okay. Yes? <coughs> but what about Cousy? So you have this expression of powers of U, and uh, so you just said that Q2 would kill when it's correct. Ah, but, uh, yes. Uh, because if you look at on the upper blackboard, this. Uh, yes. Chi, chi 1 and chi 2 is this limit you have in the vision theory. Yes. So uh, at this stage, uh, we don't know Q3. Uh, by the way, Q2 is equivalent to one loop diagrams. I will show at the quantum level. Q3 is equivalent to two loop diagrams. We don't know it precisely. 
from all the evidence that one has from the Schwarzschild case, I am making here the conjecture that all those, uh, that Q3, Q4, are also quadratic in the ultra high energy limit. And I'm going to show a confirmation of this in the sense that let's assume it is quadratic. I'm going to compute the coefficient of the quadratic term from the result of Amati, Chafaloni, Veneziano, which is evidently not a proof from the mathematical point of view, but for a physicist, it's proof enough well, that things that's are. That's only giving you uh, access to Q3, not to Q4. Right? And also Q4. Yeah. I will show how to get Q4 for subtle things of uh, ACV. Let's do it. So uh, now um, to do that, uh, uh, so ACV computed the scattering. Uh, OK, because they were in the ultra high energy limit. Uh, here, what I would like to have is the scattering of massive particles. Let's say scalar particles, because uh, I don't want to consider spin effects here. So I have two uh, scalars of different masses, quantum scalars now, M1 and M2, scattering. And under gravity, there will be a certain scattering angle and a scattering amplitude. What uh, Amati, Chafaloni, and Veneziano computed was uh, a two-loop uh, diagram uh, where, sorry, it's not, uh, maybe I should write it, uh, not in this form. And they, uh, for, uh, for gravitons, actually, for low energy uh, modes of the string, okay, like gravitons, okay, uh, because this is independent, okay, if you shoot gravitons at ultra high energy in the center of mass frame, nobody cares what was their mass originally, the mass disappears, okay? Now, uh, yes. Actually, I should say the better answer, Gregory, to your question is that when you do EOB, usually you see the masses M1, M2, everywhere. So it seems that if you take the masses will be there uh, and the high energy limit will be bad. No, what happens is what you expect. When you take the limit of ultra high energy, the masses disappear and the answer depends only on the energy of the incoming particles. And we see this already here at this level because the mass only appears in you. But when the energy goes to infinity, this term disappears. So the answer does not depend on the mass ratio. OK? Now, uh, Amati, Chaffer, and Veneziano have computed uh, in the econal approximation. And by the way, it's never clear to me uh, in what sense this is. Uh, when is the econal approximation uh, good? But they're supposed to resum uh, an infinite number of ladder and cross ladder diagrams from which they, uh, they compute the, uh, the scattering angle in the econal approximation. So actually, although their calculation is quantum, at the end, they give a classical scattering angle, which is the econal uh, scattering chi. And let me write what they write. Okay. Uh, so Amati, Chaffery, Veneziano, at the end, they write uh, sine of chi over 2 uh, so it's ACV, in the ultra high energy limit, high energy limit, is 2 alpha plus 2 alpha cubed. And now, yes. OK. So because of the analytic properties of the amplitude, that has to be analytic in S. Let me define alpha, OK? There are no, OK. Uh, they say, and uh, we are going to see it is correct, that there is no term in alpha square and no term in alpha 4. And this is why one can get an information at 4 p.m. and not only 3 p.m. because they give information that one coefficient is 0, okay? which is information. Okay? Uh, uh, they have a very long calculation. And the, the result of this calculation is to find there is a coefficient 1 here. Okay? But this calculation has never been redone. When I transform this result in terms of 1 half of chi, what is alpha? It gives 2 alpha plus 7, 6, 2 alpha cube. Let me define alpha. Indeed, it is missing. Just a moment. I want to define originally alpha as being E effective over G. Because, yes, now let's look. Uh, yes, I have erased the formula. but. Uh, if you remember, I was writing that chi was 1 over j uh, 
something which shows, let me write it, 2 e square minus 1 over square root of e square minus 1. If I go to ultra energy, this becomes 2 e square, this becomes e, so this becomes 2 e. Okay? So in the ultra high energy, the first term is in e divided by j. Uh, when you compute the second order term, uh, this one divided by j square, you get again e square over j square, except that it has a coefficient which is uh, 1 over infinity, so you get 0 times e square over j square. Okay? And uh, uh, it seems that, I mean, it's, it's very clear that the thing will be in powers of e over j square, which means, okay, in the ultra high energy limit, if you define alpha this way, you find that alpha, if, yes, now what is important is the following. The EOB transcription between effective energy and angular momentum uh, is that the effective energy is proportional to the square of the energy. Okay? So if I replace this in the definition of alpha, uh, I would get that this is g over 2 times e real square minus m1 square minus m2 square divided by j. Okay? If I go to the ultra high energy limit, I can neglect the masses. So I have the square of the real energy divided by j. But what is j? j is the impact parameter times p center of mass. Okay? But p center of mass, E real, in the ultra high energy limit is 2p because I can neglect all masses. Okay? So at the end, you see that I have the square of the energy divided again by the energy and by b. So uh, what you find is that alpha in the high energy limit is g e real divided by b. So it's just a, a trivial remark, but uh, the EOB transformation between energy guarantees that the, the parameter that appears in the expansion in terms of the effective energy can be rewritten in terms of g times the full energy of the binary system um, square root of s in the center of mass system divided by b. But this is evidently what you expect to be because at high energy, the mass is just the energy and it's the impact parameter. So the deflection should be g over b. And this is what ACV finds. So you see things uh, fit uh, very nicely and that's why it's very clear that what I said about being quadratic to all orders has to be true. And then it works to all orders. Now, when you use this result of ACV, you can transcribe it in saying that this two-loop quantum result, but econal resum and classy, rendered classical by ACV already, so it's not fully quantum as we will discuss next, is equivalent to being able to compute the uh, limiting values of Q3 and Q4 at ultra high energy, you find that they are quadratic. And when you transcribe this in a mass shell condition, the final result is that the ultra high energy scattering of two particles is equivalent to saying that these two particles move as a geodesic in the following metric, a spherically symmetric metric, which is which looks like the Schwarzschild metric for this part. And the only modification of the Schwarzschild metric is that the coefficient of uh, dt square can be written as, let me write it, as, uh, where is the thing? Yes, as 1 minus 2u times 1 plus, uh, plus a function of u, which is, 15 over 2 u square minus uh, 18 u cube uh, plus 18.45 over uh, 16 u4 plus order u5. What is nice in this formula is that this term 15 over half u square, uh, which you can compute from ACV, is also uh, correct with with this, you see 3 times 5 gives 15, and this is, uh, uh, it is this 15 over half which is here. So this is 2 p.m., it's second order in G. This is order G cube, 
and this is order G4. And these two numbers, they come from this information of ACV, and there are no other calculation uh, present that can check whether they are correct or not. But this is conceptually interesting that a calculation in string theory gives new information about the ultra high energy limit of a classical Hamiltonian. Okay, so first point. Uh, although I must say, uh, when, uh, okay, 15 over 2, 18 look nice, 1845 over 16 look a bit fishy. And if you change this, this coefficient 1, which is obtained after 20 pages of very complicated calculation using regex ribov technology and things like that, and uh, string diagrams all over, you wonder whether uh, there is not. Uh, okay, nobody has redone this calculation. <laughs> now. Uh, sorry? No, it's just, you know, uh, this has only two digits, and suddenly there are four digits. Uh, it, usually when the thing grow more naturally, you know, there is not a proof of anything, okay. Uh, it shows that nobody has done any two-loop calculation in this business, okay. Um, yes, now, this morning I said that when you use, uh, I will describe this uh, quickly, when you use, um, when you discuss LIGO type physics, and you, you, you try to describe the Hamiltonian by putting most of the information in the A function, now in the low energy limit. Uh, and uh, instead of writing the Q term as function of the energy, you write it as a function of PR only, the radial part of the momentum, because it was convenient technically. When you do that, it introduces uh, an infinity, uh, uh, one over square root, infinity of the A function at the light ring, at U equal one third, okay? Now, you can understand better this and see that this is a fictitious singularity in the following way. If you look at this, you have this, uh, this thing, which is a quadratic function of the energy, but multiplied by this function. Self-force expansion is an expansion in powers of nu. If I expand this a function uh, in powers of nu, you see that it will, uh, so if I expand 1 minus 1 over square root of 1 plus 2 nu e effective minus 1 in powers of nu, you see that it will start like, uh, let me get it right, <laughs> uh, plus nu effective e minus 1 plus terms of order nu square e effective minus one square, etc. And if you work in self-force expansion where you keep only the first power of nu, you have now something which instead of going to one when energy goes to infinity, because this thing goes to one, goes to infinity. And, and the Hamiltonian, which was quadratic in E, becomes cubic in E. And when you look at it, it's this cubic nature in E which generated the pole. But you see that if you take the exact thing at 2 p.m., which is not uh, the full thing you want, it suggests that it's just a problem of expansion, that you, you use an expansion in power of nu, which is not valid when the product of nu and this becomes of order one. It is just a limited expansion for small uh, thing, etc. So it gives, uh, it gives a new, uh, so it's an example where, so here I've given two, two examples where using not the post-Newtonian, but post-Minkowskian approach, gives you interesting information. From ACV, you extract something new, and something that looked a bit strange, now you understand better why it was a bad expansion to do in terms of new. Now, let me discuss the high energy regime behavior. Uh, so I will keep this. Yes. I want to discuss, before coming to the quantum amplitude thing, uh, discuss something which is linked to an interesting regge type behavior of uh, binary black holes uh, at ultra high energy. Where again, the EOB nature uh, of the energy map plays a crucial role to get a regge slope, a linear regge trajectory. Let me, okay, what I said must look very mysterious, so this is actually simple. So let me, uh, let me consider the following problem. 
I take two black holes. Yes. Uh, I at this stage, this uh, I'm thinking physically, so I'm interested in black holes. Uh, but uh, yes, do I, yes, I stop. Uh, yes, I can stop um, now if you want. Or I describe it very quickly, and then we go uh, quantum. What about that? Uh, I take two black holes, and I shoot them uh, like that. The question is, uh, before we were discussing the case where they have a large impact parameter, and therefore they deflect simply. If I diminish the impact parameter, what happens is they start deflecting a lot. Okay? If I diminish further the impact parameter, they will actually merge. There will be a critical impact parameter where the two things go from infinity, and then they go direct merger. By the way, in all this calculation, this is the, um, this is the conservative part of the dynamics. So I am taking a uh, time symmetric Green's function. So no gravitons are emitted at infinity, no energy loss. Okay? So uh, when I have energy loss, I, uh, I have to correct for this. Yes, except that you know the impact parameter is such that if you put stars, they will uh, the stars will uh, merge before. Uh, you need very compact objects, okay? And the most compact objects are elementary particles or uh, black holes. Okay. The point I want to uh, say is the um, is the following. The value of B in terms of the yes, it's two. Radius. We will we are going to compute this critical radius. So. Okay. Uh, assuming this, I can compute the, this critical radius. And then we have new information. And then at this, at this critical radius, what will happen is when the two black holes get near, actually, if you don't go beyond the critical radius, the two black holes will be on a circular orbit, you see? At the, and then they will whirl around each other indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So at the end, I have a binary system of two black holes of ultra high energy, uh, going around near the velocity of light uh, on an unstable circular orbit. Now let's compute this unstable circular orbit. The way to compute it is immediate from the Hamiltonian because the, Hamil the effective Hamiltonian here is made of several parts and what is crucial uh, in, in the real world I mean, radiation will destabilize the thing ultimately. Yes, yes. But there are ways to That's do numerical right. simulations. There are ways to correct for this. And from numerical simulation, you can access this. Okay? I'm not saying uh, yes. Actually, we have done that for slow motion, for instance. We have used EUB to compute what happens. Huh? Because you can take into account the radiation lost up to merger. And, and this gives you, uh, when you reach the critical thing, before radiation has time to act again and do something. It's okay. But this is still a blurred uh, thing because it's. I'm not saying uh, the answer is immediate. What I want to say is that if I plot the effective, the effective energy, uh, I'm interested in circular orbits. So in circular orbits, uh, PR is equal to zero. In this formula, uh, what you get is therefore that this is a function of u and uh, P phi, the angular momentum j. Uh, if I plot it as a function of u, what do you get? You get something which is like that. That is, uh, this is the centrifugal barrier. OK, this is u. u is gm over r, which means that uh, when they are far apart, this is here. This is infinity in real space. And the fact that this is 1 means the gravitational interaction is 0 at infinity. Then there is actually an attractive potential, <coughs> minus uh, u. And then there is a centrifugal potential, which in Newtonian physics would go to infinity and would mean the two objects can go around. In gravity, the centrifugal potential is multiplied by you know, 1 minus 2u, which means that this thing goes to 0 to u equal 1 half. So the centrifugal barrier has to go down. Okay. This is just an EOB description of the circular orbits of two bodies. Now, in this thing, what is the, the critical impact parameter? It is the energy at infinity, which is here. If I, have, if I shoot particles at infinity with this energy, this means they will come together. 
And this is an unstable, but this is a circular orbit. So it, it corresponds precisely to this circular orbit. So the impact parameter can be obtained just from the Hamiltonian. Okay? So let's take this, and let's take this in the uh, uh, ultra energy uh, limit. And what you find is just from the result uh, written above, you can compute that uh, for this system, the uh, square of the energy, S, Mandelstam parameter, so S is the square of the real energy of the system, is a function along these things of the angular momentum, which has a linear slope. That is what you find is the Regge slope of the square of this system, this bind bound system and uh, unstable bound system of two black holes, is such that, so S is a linear function of J, and I can compute the slope. First, this slope, because of the OB formula, is 2 over G, the uh, derivative of the effective energy as function of small J, and it is very easy to see why the effective energy is linear in J. And when you uh, compute things, you find that this thing is equal to 0 0.435087 over G if you use the 2 p.m. approximation. If you use the ACV result, which gives you corrections to this, you don't get 0. Point, uh, but this number is replaced by 0.719964. And uh, so the conclusion is this system are such that the square of the energy is uh, a number of order unity divided by Newton's constant uh, times the angular momentum. Uh, and we remember that an extreme Schwarzschild black hole is such that the square of an extreme Schwarzschild black hole uh, is actually as a linear Regge trajectory also, we slope now 1 over g exactly. So here there is a number uh, c of order 1. It is not clear if this number should be 1. That is to say, if this system should be essentially identical to an extreme curve black hole or just nearby. Many people have tried to compute this thing. I just want here to remark that this critical thing, that ACV, for ACV, this thing is the threshold of black hole formation. So you know this is important uh, classically in quantum mechanically. People are doing numerical simulation. I just wanted to show that EOB gives a one-line way of computing this if you know the post-Minkowskian thing. Like, uh, let me stop here for 10 minutes, then we'll go quantum. OK. So now we finally reach. Uh, what was the aim of this thing, which is uh, how to navigate uh, between uh, various things. Uh, uh, first, all that is motivated by a LIGO type of uh, coalescing uh, binary systems things. Uh, LIGO is not interested in scattering states and quantum scattering states. But uh, the EUB is a way, method, is a way of transcribing, I mean, of describing what you need here in terms of an Hamiltonian. And we have shown in, in the previous thing that this uh, Hamiltonian can be obtained not only by post-Newtonian type calculation for bound systems, but from classical scattering, actually in a very uh, direct way, post-Minkowskian classical scattering. And now I want to uh, speak about the link between quantum scattering amplitudes and uh, classical Hamiltonians. First, uh, using EOB as a transcription uh, medium, a way of conveying information, uh, because what I've shown here is a one-loop classical scattering uh, gives an order uh, G square uh, Hamiltonian which describe both scattering and bound states, OK? So uh, the main point that I'm trying to push people to do is that uh, as classically uh, uh, two-loop classical scattering calculation uh, looks uh, complicated by the method that I know how to do, 
I'm hoping that modern amplitude methods using on-shell method and double copy should more easily get the two-loop gravitational scattering, quantum scattering. And what I will describe is how, assuming this result exists, how this thing can be transcribed in terms of a classical EOB and Hamiltonian, which then can be used for binary system and LIGO, which would be a use of quantum calculations for LIGO physics, which is conceptually nice. The ACV example already showed something. Now, the idea that quantum scattering calculations can be connected with classical Hamiltonian description was started in the 70s after early work in the 60s, in particular by the Japanese group, in particular by Iwasaki, who, uh, who uh, did, uh, computed uh, those Feynman diagrams. So now these are quantum uh, scattering uh, amplitudes under gravity exchange of, uh, of scalar particles, okay? And who, uh, when computing the Feynman integrals, made a post newton expansion by saying, okay, let's assume the momenta are small, I'm in the corner, huh? and then uh, related this to the Einstein infield of man 1 pn Hamiltonian. So already in his calculation, he has shown that uh, this thing is directly connected with the 1 pn uh, uh, Hamiltonian uh, of Einstein infield of man uh, Lorentz and Drost. Okay? Uh, but everything was done in a pn sense. Okay? Uh, my point is that uh, if we want to do it without making small velocity uh, assumptions. Uh, so in a post minkowskian sense, you get uh, more information. But the question is how you get it. So what I will show, so first, there is, uh, there is a problem. The problem is the, uh, is the following, is the criterion of the validity of the Born expansion, okay? Because the, uh, the criterion of the validity of the Born expansion uh, for the gravitational scattering of two particles of energy E1 and E2 is that uh, G E1 times E2 over H bar V, where V is the relative velocity, is much smaller than one, okay? But evidently, the classical scattering of two particles is valid in the opposite limit because the classical scattering is when formally h bar goes to zero, uh, and therefore this quantity actually is much larger. Okay? So we cannot, or at least I don't know how to start from a quantum amplitude given by a Born expansion, which is, uh, I cannot take directly the classical limit of this. Okay? It, it does not contain directly the information about the classical scattering angle. The classical scattering angle chi I was talking about will appear in the S matrix if I do the H bar going to zero, the classic classical limit of scattering, but then it will go in the exponent, uh, I exponential I delta over H bar, and this is a large phase uh, scattering. Why? Born expansion is by definition a small dephasing, okay? So, but we all know that most people don't notice this because by accident, the Born approximation of the Coulomb potential gives exactly the Rutherford uh, scattering, okay? So when you look at first order in the Born approximation, you don't see that the next order term uh, is either quantum or classical, but uh, uh, it does not work immediately. So uh, what I suggested in the paper which is given in reference is a way to bypass this is that uh, is to, uh, so a dictionary between the classical Hamiltonian and the quantum scattering is to take the classical EOB Hamiltonian and to quantize it, okay? We are going to show that uh, you can express the classical EOB Hamiltonian as just uh, classical potential scattering, only trivial potential scattering, and you can quantize it immediately. And I will do it at the one loop level. I, say I will quantize the, uh, so now I will com compute a quantum scattering from the EUB point of view. And after doing this quantum amplitude calculation, I will check that this is equal to one loop calculation that exists in the literature. Except that when I did that, I found that all the results in the literature were incorrect in some ways. They had wrong signs, wrong relative factors, you know, but uh, inside the formulas. The referee suggested 
Ah, maybe you should check the paper of Guevara, which was just before I had submitted my thing. Indeed, in the paper of Alfredo Guevara, which was a one loop using Cachazo Guevara uh, method, uh, the overall sign was wrong, but at least the relative factors between the things were correct, okay? But this is one loop, okay? We really need uh, two-loop calculation, but let me show you how to do, how to quantize the one-loop post-Minkowski unexpanded. So, uh, so one-loop post-Minkowski unexpanded thing is the 2 p.m. thing I was talking about, the, what I just talked about in the previous lecture, which used, you remember, they were explicit one-loop diagrams, but computed now in post-Minkowski, not doing post-Newtonian approximation. So what was the result? The result was, uh, that we had the mass shell condition from EOB, which was uh, G0 mu nu P mu. So I scaled uh, the mass square to have one here, plus Q hat, where this was Schwarzschild, and this thing was the Q. Uh, uh, what was this Q? Yes, this Q at the 2 p.m. approximation is simply U square Q2 of the energy. And, uh, okay, this is at the 2 p.m. Let me consider this first classically. Let me now write the Schwarzschild metric not in uh, Schwarzschild coordinates, but in isotropic coordinates. Isotropic coordinates means the Schwarzschild metric, ds0 square, is written as a function of a new u, which is not the same as before, let's call it u bar, plus the coefficient uh, b multiplies uh, dr square plus r square d omega square. In other words, b multiply dx square. It is conformal. The space metric is conformal to the Euclidean metric, okay? This is why it's called isotropic, because the radial direction is not uh, different from the other directions in this case. And the function a and b for Schwarzschild are known exactly. Evidently, it's a trivial... Uh, calculation, it is, but it's different from the usual Schwarzschild, you know, it's 1 plus 1 half to the power 4, square is square, and B of U bar is 1 plus 1 half of U bar to the power 4. Anyway, this is an, ex it's Schwarzschild, it's an exact solution of Einstein's equation, and now let us write the, U is again GM over R. Uh, U bar is yes, and U bar is GM over R bar. As you say, there is a new radial coordinate, R bar. So, uh, okay, GM over R bar. So it's the new 1 over R coordinate. Now, uh, when you, uh, you find, uh, so again, I'm in Jacobi. So at the, at the quasi-classical level, the mass shell condition, I can write immediately uh, as an Hamilton Jacobi equation. And uh, this Hamilton Jacobi equation will be let me write it explicitly, will be minus uh, E effective uh, square divided. It's the same formula as before. It's, it's G mu nu, it is, yeah, it's this, okay? So it gives a Marshall condition, which is minus B over R uh, energy, uh, sorry, square, uh, plus one, plus P square, now isotropic, uh, so PR square and P phi square are put together, divided by B bar. Uh, plus u bar uh, 2, q2 two of the energy, okay? Plus, anyway, this Marshall condition is known only uh, modulo terms of order u cube, okay? Now, if I rewrite this thing by multiplying by some powers of u, you find easily that this Marshall condition is equivalent to saying that p square is, is as this form, is p infinity plus a certain function of uh, u bar, uh, where this function of u bar is actually, let me write it, is p infinity plus something linear in u bar plus quadratic in u bar square and plus something cubic, but which I must neglect at this stage. Anyway, the trivial point. The d square is a correct one for Schwarzschild or uh, Which one, sorry? This is Schwarzschild exact. This is the exact Schwarzschild. But now I take this exact Schwarzschild plus the new 2 p.m. information, and I expand in powers of u, and you get a classical mass shell condition, 
which says what? Which says that the kinetic energy, p square, is equal to a constant p infinity square. Let me write what is p infinity square. All the coefficients that appear here are function of the energy of the system. E square minus 1, OK. W1, we are going to recognize this thing, is 2 two, two energy square minus 1. So W1 uh, is, um, was the coefficient chi1, was the coefficient of the first order scattering. And W2 is also the coefficient which appears in the scattering, which was 3 half of 5 energy square minus 1 divided by the square root thing 1 plus 2 nu energy effective minus 1. But the, on, the, the, the trivial point is that, so this condition is p square plus a certain function of u equal constant. But this is the Schrodinger equation. I mean, this is, the, this is energy conservation. Uh, but uh, immediately, uh, if I want to quantize this, this uh, I say evidently this is the time independent Schrodinger equation, so it is potential scattering. So finally, this thing, it is a relativistic case, okay? This is a relativistic motion which can be ultra relativistic, but technically it is p square plus a function of 1 over r. Uh, equal a constant. So it is like poten non-relativistic potential scattering. And therefore, uh, if I write the, uh, the energy-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation, uh, the quantum uh, scattering is obtained by solving, uh, solving a potential problem, if you want the Lippmann-Schwinger equation. Uh, and which problem? The problem, so... Because, because uh, the reason is uh, this way I have p square, which is isotropic. And therefore, when I have Schrodinger, I have the Laplace operator. If I am in radial coordinates, I have pr square. I have something which is anisotropic, uh, which complicates a little bit the technology. Okay. That's uh, indeed the, the only technical reason. So now. Uh, how do I quantize that? I just say that uh, my, my coordinates now satisfy, uh, are, they have a, a non-trivial commutation relation, which is e i h bar hat, I will explain what is hat, delta i j. The reason why it is, there is a hat and why h bar hat is not h bar is that h bar hat is h bar divided by g m1, m2. The reason is simply that uh, when I wrote this thing, I have rescaled things. Okay? I told you I descaled by the mass by m1, m2. When you put together the various rescaling, you find that the commutator of x and p is differs by h bar by just g m1, m2. But this is good, by the way, because this is dimensionless. So this is the inverse fine structure constants of gravity, you know, uh, usually constructs a, C equal 1, yes. Instead of E bar E square over uh, H bar C, I have G M1, M2 over H bar C. This is the inverse fine structure constant, which should be small for a quantum uh, calculation, uh, sorry, small for a classical calculation and can be uh, large for a quantum calculation. So, therefore, when, uh, when I quantize this, what is the problem? The problem is to have minus, I have a Schrodinger equation, which is minus h bar square Laplace with respect to my Cartesian coordinates. That's why I use uh, p square. I have now the Laplace operator. Psi of x, so I write the amplitude uh, of scattering, I mean before computing the scattering. And this satisfies simply p infinity square plus w over r bar plus w2 over r bar square plus terms of over 1 cube uh, times psi of x. OK. And now uh, I'm going to compute just what is the, the wave function propagating in this. Uh, the, the new information is that, so all the 2PM information is in this term. You know? What is also nice, if you want, is that all the PM, the 1PM information is contained 
in a Coulomb type problem. Because if I neglect uh, 2 p.m., which I'm not going to do, this problem is the Coulomb wave function, okay, that we know explicitly. And but W1, ah yes, now we see that indeed W1 uh, was a complicated function of the energy. So W1 is not the Newtonian approximation. It's not like GM. It was. I can apply this thing to ultra energy uh, scattering, okay, quantum scattering. Uh, now to solve this problem um, is easy. Uh, I write that the the wave function. Uh, okay, so if I introduce you open Messiah, Messiah, <laughs> just to refresh your memory about uh, the thing, it's quite good actually, you know? and uh, the notations are clear. You have uh, uh, incoming uh, plane waves, you know, uh, outgoing plane waves is the notation of Messiah, Messiah, this, and uh, the outgoing wave function that you look for uh, of x, yeah, x or uh, r is the same thing, yes, uh, x, okay, vector, uh, is um, at infinity should be the incoming uh, uh, wave, okay, plus the scattering amplitude, potential scattering as a function of the angle uh, uh, in the direction you look at, okay with an uh, outgoing wave, OK? And the formula for the uh, scattering amplitude is simply here in the angle omega b is equal, so you keep track of signs and uh, factors, and you have 1 over 4 pi h hat uh, bar square, uh, the sandwiching of the potential. So this is the potential, OK? W bar uh, between uh, an exact wave function and an, uh, an ingoing wave function. Okay, and as you know, the born, uh, the first born approximation consists in replacing phi plus just by the incoming waves. But you need the second born approximation because the first born approximation in order g, so you need terms of order g square. But this is easy because the first order term is Coulomb. So uh, if you want Coulomb to uh, high order, you open Messia or Landau Lifshitz, you have the exact Coulomb wave function. And therefore, uh, there is no problem with iterating the first born approximation. You just read it in a textbook. And, and, and then what you get is that, uh, is that the, 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 the amplitude, Ka, as a function uh, uh, for an incoming momentum k and as a function of an outgoing momentum kb is equal to 1 over h bar at square times times what the uh, times uh, times the the fourier transform uh, so uh, the first born approximation for the full potential is the Fourier transform of this potential. So I need the Fourier transform of 1 over r and the Fourier transform of 1 over uh, r square. So the Fourier transform in three dimension of, uh, anyway, there are general formulas for this. Let me just write this. The Fourier transform of 1 over r, as everybody knows, is 4 pi over k square. And the Fourier transform uh, of 1 over r square uh, <laughs> is uh, 2 pi square over k, OK? So the, the only, uh, so in the calculation, you take the Fourier transform of this, the Fourier transform of this, but then you need to correct this by the second order uh, Coulomb wave function. So at the end, what it gives is that this is exponential delta c, w1 over q square, plus uh, pi over 2, w2, Q square over Q, okay, uh, where where delta C is the uh, Coulomb phase correction, which is I W one over two K H bar hat square log of sine square theta over two, where theta is the scattering angle between outgoing KB. I have Ka 
and Kb with an angle theta between the two. So I have this log of sine square plus 2i argument of the gamma function at 1 minus i w1 over 2 k h bar square. Okay? And by the way, uh, I wrote this formula explicitly to show that uh, you see here as parameter uh, 1 over h bar square, uh, which, uh, which shows that uh, the, the, the Born expansion is valid actually for large h hat, okay? It's valid for small coupling. So this is the inverse coupling strength. It's the inverse of the gravitational fine structure constant. So the Born expansion is an expansion in 1 over h bar square. Uh, and there, therefore, these terms are indeed small. Uh, and when I expand them, I get the full Born expansions, okay? But if I was looking the classical limit, uh, h bar would tend, h bar hat would tend to zero. And then I see that indeed the Born expansion is not valid, okay? Uh, that's why we had to, uh, to uh, do this quantization of the, uh, of the EUB Hamiltonian. The conclusion is that this term is of order uh, G square. Uh, so now if I, if I think of computing a scattering amplitude by a Born expansion, a Feynman expansion, it will be in powers of G. And this term uh, starts at order g but contains g square correction, plus etc., which are uh, this type of corrections. Remember that uh, h bar hat is contains 1 over g, so uh, 1 over h bar has g up, okay? Uh, and there is g, uh, yes, okay. This 1 over h bar square contains, uh, anyway, the, all the things work uh, at the end. It is an expansion in powers of g. Uh, you check, uh, okay, yes, uh, as you know, in quantum amplitudes, there is always the problem of normalization. That is to say, uh, what is the normalization of the wave functions? What is your normalization of amplitude? Okay, in principle, this is trivial, but sometimes it's a bit complicated. So to avoid this problem of normalization, you can just make the ratio between the, uh, if the amplitude is, uh, something of order uh, g and something of order uh, g square plus etc. Uh, I concentrate on the ratio between the one loop amplitude and the one graviton exchange. So this, this is one, let me write what it is. The, the one graviton exchange uh, amplitude, let me write it. Where is it? Yes. The one graviton exchange amplitude is, which is of order uh, g, is 16 pi times g m1 square m2 square divided by h bar, now the, the real h bar, times 2 effective square minus 1 over the transfer squared transfer momentum uh, with my conventions t uh, is negative so minus t is uh, positive uh, yeah there is also a sign convention for m because also the sign convention for m plus i t minus i t uh, depends on uh, who is doing what which is always uh, a bit annoying um, this modulo analytic terms so so this thing says that the ratio between the ratio between the, the g square amplitude and uh, uh, so this is a one graviton exchange thing, okay? This thing, and uh, why this thing contains in particular uh, one loop exchange, okay? That this thing must be equal to the ratio between this and this, okay? And when doing this ratio, uh, the nice thing is actually you don't even need this Coulomb correction because you do the ratio between this, which is order g squared, to this, which is order g. So you are already of order g. So it means that this. Uh, it has. Uh, it is imaginary. This is an argument, so it's an angle. Okay. Then it has. Uh, it's the. It, it contains the Coulomb phase. Okay. This is the. The i is contained. Yes. The i. 
Yes, sorry, the I is here. Yeah, it's not put here. It is put here. Yes. Not twice. OK. So uh, at the end, this ratio should be equal to the ratio between this f, which is normalized differently. So this calculation, yes. So now there is also the issue which is not totally clear to me, which is among the amplitude, yeah, there are papers in the literature saying that uh, in an amplitude, there are terms that are called classical contribution to the amplitude and quantum contributions, OK? Uh, uh, at this order, it's not ambiguous that the uh, classical amplitude is the part of the tr uh, transition amplitude, which is 1 over Q. Q is the momentum transfer, by the way. Yeah, I forgot to say that uh, Q is uh, Kb uh, minus K, OK? And, and Q square, Q square is the squared momentum transfer, uh, which is uh, minus T, OK? So, here I have 1 over Q square, which we recognize is the Coulomb, uh, 1 over R thing, and 1 over Q is, is the next term, OK? So uh, indeed, uh, at the one loop level, uh, if I take the ratio of the part of the amplitude which is in 1 over Q and the part of the amplitude which is 1 over Q square, which is Coulomb type, I get an explicit result, which is 3 pi I, I give this example to be clear, and to see structure. So it's 3 pi over 8 times 5 effective energy square minus 1 divided by 2 effective energy square minus 1 times g m1 plus m2 times square root of minus t divided by h bar, OK? Uh, and there is the G here, modulo terms of order G square. So let me frame this, because this is the main result of this calculation. OK, so, so you see, to, to summarize, from EOB, there is a transcription of the dynamics, the complicated dynamics of two black holes at a rather high level of approximation where it's, it can be ultra relativistic or relativistic or whatever. But finally, it gives a potential problem with a potential which is 1 over r plus 1 over r squared. I mean, what, how simpler it could be, OK? But the coefficient of 1 over r and 1 over r squared are complicated function of the energy that includes square roots of 1 over OK? But, uh, but it is very easy. To, uh, to compute the, 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 the amplitude, to make the ratio of the amplitude at order g square and at order g. And when you put together all the thing I had written, which used all the information I explained in the previous lecture, like 2 p.m. one loop thing, so all the one loop classical calculation has computed this function, this function, uh, you get this result uh, at the end. And then you ask, are there computations in the literature at the one loop amplitude where if I make the ratio, I get this? And, and this is where that uh, most results were not correct. And the one of Guevara had just an overall wrong sign. But apart from that, bec maybe because he was using unitary methods, which uh, you lose, uh, you have the square, so you lose the sign. I don't know. It means one has to be careful for the future. But all this structure uh, indeed was there. So, it's an explicit check that a quantum uh, one-loop calculation. Uh, so I could do in reverse, for instance, if we had not done before the, the classical uh, 2 p.m. calculation, the classical one-loop, uh, I could have used the result of Guevara to compute this. And then I would have obtained this. And then I would have obtained the 2 p.m. Hamiltonian I wrote before. You see, this is in that sense that there is a dictionary, classical quantum, which can be used both ways. And, and that's why I am eager to see uh, two-loop quantum calculations to be able to uh, extend this to the next order and extract from the two-loop uh, amplitude calculations something which will be now the, the 3 p.m. Uh, classical uh, EOB Hamiltonian. And uh, there will be many checks because uh, first, from the ACV calculation, the ultra high energy, we know the coefficient, okay, assuming this is correct. But once you have the Hamiltonian 
uh, the Hamiltonian, you can get it. If it, if it is obtained in a post Minkowskian approximation, this means it is valid for all velocities. So I can take also the low velocity limit of this, and we know that to four loops. So uh, I mean, one can detect any small error in any calculation and, uh, and do many checks. See? And yes, and, and so indeed, let me uh, summarize the thing. The idea there, which was the idea of this, of many papers uh, of uh, Itzikson, we are in Itzikson room, Itzikson, uh, um, uh, Zuber, and uh, was Zuber? No, uh, uh, Zin Justin, and uh, no, it was not Zuber, sorry. Uh, Brezin. Brezin, yes. Brezin, Itzikson, uh, Zin Justin, and I should have mentioned Todorov also, uh, because it seems that the Logunov school had uh, tried for years to transcribe uh, scattering amplitude into potential, okay? Although these potential were uh, momentum dependent in a complicated way and never, uh, here we have a very trivial momentum dependence. The fact that you have a potential which is, you know, energy dependent, but just one over R, one over R square makes it very easy to know uh, the discussion of this. Uh, sorry, the, <laughs> the calculation, what was the question? <laughs> yes, so the idea, the idea of all those things was to say, let's start from scattering amplitudes and maybe even the econal approximation uh, of scattering amplitudes and transcribe it in a form that can predict bound states, either by analytic continuation or going through a potential, okay? This is the same idea here. We start with scattering, uh, quantum or classical, but once this is transcribed in an Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian then describes bound states, you see? When you go to a classical Hamiltonian description, you have immediately uh, bound states. So this is a way to transcribe uh, like quantum scattering information into bound state information for gravity, including what I discussed before, which is, uh, which is that this ultra energy bound states of two black holes going at the velocity of light, you know, for infinite uh, angular momentum and this critical parameter, all that would be contained uh, by an AT continuation in a, in a quantum uh, scattering calculation. But, but what do you mean by bound state in the, in the gravitational case? Uh, bound state means uh, elliptic motion in the classical gravitational okay. case. That's what it means. You remember that the beginning of VOB was to say, I start with uh, elliptic type motion. Mm -hmm. I describe them by the Delaunay Hamiltonian, which means the energy is expressed in terms of the action variables. Yeah. But this is in one-to-one -one correspondence in the quasi-classical limit with quantum bound states, discrete bound states, where the action variables are quantized in units of H bar. And therefore, that's why from EOB, you were identifying action variables in the effective and the real problem, because this way you are sure that the discrete quantum bound states correspond to each other. That's the basics of EUB in the bound states. Why in the, in the scattering situation, you are using something else, which is the scattering angle as function of energy and angular momentum. You no longer have discrete states because these are continuous states, but this is the same dictionary finally. Which corresponds to hyperbolic trajectories. Which corresponds to hyperbolic trajectories. So uh, yes, there is something else. So I have uh, essentially finished what I wanted to say. There is something that I did not, uh, I wanted to say, I did not say. Uh, let me say it uh, briefly and uh, end up uh, a little bit early. Everybody will be happy about that. Is to speak about uh, uh, post-Minkowskian spin orbit uh, coupling calculations. I have, I have talked essentially here about uh, non s the scattering of non-spinning black holes, okay? Uh, there is the issue, which is if one computes uh, at the quantum level, if, if I compute the quantum scattering amplitudes for spinning objects, we quantum spin, okay? First, you need to use a technology that I can describe arbitrarily high spins to be sure to be able to recognize classical spin effects, okay? But there are techniques for that. But from the classical point of view, uh, let me tell you about, uh, let me push this up, about some recent work done uh, in collaboration with Donato Bini. And there is also interesting work by uh, Justin Vines uh, at the 1 p.m. level. 
and we work at the 2 p.m. level, which is a spin effect in scattering. Okay, so let me finish my previous sentence. My previous sentence is that it is not clear that if I have a quantum scattering amplitude uh, for spinning quantum particles, uh, how do I extract? So it means uh, it means I have spin states, okay? So I have scattering between various spin states. How do I recognize from this classical spin orbit couplings, okay, in the amplitude, okay? There is no half spin. No, no, half, uh, the, the problem is that you don't want just spin one half because you need to recognize the uh, spin, spin square, spin cube, so you need arbitrary spin, okay. So from the classical point of view, the situation is uh, different and in a sense uh, cleaner because I said before that the scattering of two uh, massive particles, uh, when you view it classically, the information, all the information is contained in the, the change of angle between the incoming momenta, P1, and P prime 1, okay? Uh, finally, everything is in the scattering angle, just a scalar, okay? Now, when you have spinning particles, first you need some technology for spinning particles. Uh, if you work linearly in spin, uh, uh, you can endow the world lines. A spinning world line means a world line along which there is not only a mass and a four velocity, but also, a sp so there is the four velocity u1 and p1 is equal to m1 u1, so it is a vector tangent to the world line. And, perpendicular. and there is, I have a spin vector, which is a four vector in space time, which is perpendicular to uh, u1, this thing. And now, uh, now you have what we called with Donato Bini uh, spin holonomy. In, see, what is the information on scattering on spin? The information on scattering on spin is that the incoming spin will be rotated with respect to the, I mean, the outgoing spin will be rotated with respect to the ingoing spin. But, uh, but actually, you want to use, okay, in the effective, let me just say this. In the effective one-body description, the spin vectors you use are not space-time spin vectors which are orthogonal to the world line, which means they would not be in space. They are projection of the spin vectors, in some sense, in, uh, uh, in usual space. That is to say, a t equal constant in the center of mass, okay, in the center of mass frame, you have uh, slices, you have a special preferred vector in space-time, time-like axis, and then you can actually boost these vectors into vectors which are now new space-time vectors which are in, in this hyperplane, and, and these are the vectors that you want to use in an Hamiltonian formulation, okay? You, you show three that. Vectors. Three vectors, yeah, yeah special. And then, and then what you are interested in is what is the change between this vector for minus infinity and, and plus infinity. And this, and this uh, as you remember that the, the Hamiltonian, uh, the effective Hamiltonian was written as an orbital Hamiltonian that uh, when I work linearly in the spin depends only on position and momenta but not on spin, plus two terms that contain uh, GS over L and, uh, and momenta L dot S plus G S star times L dot S star, where S was the sum of the two spin vectors, these spin vectors, and S star was the sum of, of mass-weighted spin vector of this type. But in the three space. In three space. The arrow means here that everything is in three space. Okay, but from this equation, you have an Hamiltonian which has an L dot S coupling. But this means that you get from Hamilton equation, ds1 by dt is, uh, is S1 uh, commuted in the Poisson bracket sense with the Hamiltonian, okay? And, and this means that you get modulo uh, a sign that I did not put here, so I do not guarantee the sign, let me say, plus or minus one, uh, 
of uh, Gs L cross S1. Okay, when you when you uh, sorry, there is a Gs. There is a contribution in Gs and a contribution in uh, Gs star. Okay, you do the Poisson bracket of this Hamiltonian with respect to S1, so it gives uh, something with Gs uh, L and something with Gs star, things like that. So what this means is this spin-orbit coupling say that uh, along the motion of the two bodies, when they do scattering, the spin vector will uh, rotate, okay, by spin-orbit coupling. So, uh, so what you do is you compute the total change, so which means the, the spin vector at plus infinity uh, will differ from the spin vector at minus infinity in time by a rotation matrix, a 3 by 3, and SO3 rotation matrix. So this rotation matrix is given actually by a Dyson expansion of this thing. That's okay. What you call your yes, and that's exactly we, what we call holonomy is just this rotation for minus infinity of the spin vector. But this thing you can compute from the post Minkowskian theory. So what we did with Donato was to compute uh, in the same way that before I said you can compute the scattering angle. You can here write that the equation of motion of the spin S1 in space-time is actually S1 is covariantly propagated in the metric G, you know. Uh, so you get that something like that uh, equals zero. So in space-time, each four, four vector which represent the spin is parallelly propagated in the metric G, which is generated by the two world lines. So what you do is you do again perturbation theory. This metric is, uh, as before, a sum of terms you know of this type. <coughs> and so we computed it. I mean, this metric was computed in the 1980s by uh, us and others. And so you can use this old result of the metric. But now you compute what is the, the spin holonomy in that sense. You do the projection, and it gives you an identity between this rotation that you compute for the real problem and the rotation where you put a certain GS, which depends on GS. And this way, you can compute the spin orbit couplings in post Minkowskian approximation. OK, that's the point I wanted to make. And then this is what we did with uh, Donato, uh, Bini. And let me just, uh, so we got we got explicit formula at second post Minkowskian order for this uh, spin orbit coupling, which were not known before because they were known only. So this is beyond everything which was known in PN sense, although uh, in velocity expansion, not in G expansion. So we have new information about the spin orbit couplings. The formulas are rather complicated, uh, but the, the essence of the thing is that at the end, when you look at, uh, at this Gs multiplied by u cube, so that they start, you know, by 2 here. And uh, uh, when you look them as function of the energy, because th th this is true for any energy, even very high energy, what you find is that as function of the energy, they, they decrease. When the energy goes down, these uh, spin -off. So you get information about the fact that some things, you know, decrease with energy. They also decrease with the, uh, with the, if you get closer, if the two bodies get closer, so this is uh, low energy, this is high energy, and this is the two bodies get close and things like that. So anyway, it's new information obtained by post minkowskian approximation, which is complementary to what was known before. And uh, one of the things for the future is now we have a lot of information from post-Newtonian, from self-force, from post-Minkowskian, hopefully from quantum calculations. And the summary of all the lectures is to say that uh, um, to combine this information and transcribe it in a uniform way, it's convenient to use the OB framework as a transcription language, you know, because otherwise you don't know what to do with this information. It's, it's some information, but you don't know what to do useful for LIGO for it. Why? EOB is just from the practical point of view a rather simple scheme that can use information from many different, including numerical relativity and quantum information. So that was the summary in one uh, word of uh, the lectures I gave. Thank you for uh, your attention. <laughs>
so I gave references to the, for the non-spinning case, uh, I gave references. Uh, for the spinning case, if you look at uh, Bini Damour, uh, it's the one which is called, uh, yes, 2018. Yes. At the second post Minkowskian approximation, yes, it's this one, which mm -hmm. is the new information. Yes. So, okay, so thanks, uh, Thibault, for, uh, for the great discussion.